welcome to Narayana AS. This is a part of daily news analysis in which we select certain articles from the Hindu as well as Indian Express and do a detailed discussions on the topics that are chosen. The topics that have been selected today are as follows. Firstly, joint elections undemocratic consultations I was, says Congress. It is from the Indian Express, page number one. Next, the problem with India's science management. It is from the Hindu, page number six. Next. Reforms led to India's success in sports. Prime Minister. It is from the Hindu. Page number one. Next. Nagara style temple architecture in which Ram temple is being built. It is from the Indian Express. Page number 15. The last one. How do you plan to save the great Indian bastard? Supreme Court asks government. It is from the Indian Express. Page number 10. Now, let us start our detailed daily news analysis. Government of India has constituted a panel under the chairmanship of ex-president Ramnath Kovind to recommend measures through which we could implement one nation, one election, that is simultaneous elections, where center and state goes to elections at one period of time or one point of time, so that we could elect members to the parliament in Lok Sabha, as well as elect members of the state legislative assemblies. Because presently we are in election cycles throughout the year, five years continually, one or the other election, either it might be parliament election or certain seats within the parliament, that is, we are specifically talking about Lok Sabha here. At the same time, the state legislative assemblies, where certain states are in elections at one point of time, one period of time, one year or the other year, etc. So this is said to have caused the administrative hurdles in continuing the administrative functioning, thus in effect hampering the ability of the government to deliver on its promises. As well as this frequent campaigning is hindering our societal peace where the electioneering or the election campaigning is leading to the sowing of divisions in the citizenry to garner votes. So, to stop this election cycle, government of India has proposed conducting simultaneous elections. But it has its own challenges. The topic, the relevance of the topic is learning one nation, one election, election reforms and simultaneous elections and its impacts on federalism. Next, UPSC syllabus, GS Paper 2, Salient Features of Representations of People Act. Indian Constitution features amendments, significant provisions and basic structure. Issues and challenges pertaining to the federal structure. This is what we are going to learn in this article. We have previous year questions that are asked on the elections. Like for example, the Election Commission of India is a five-member body. And regarding the statements considering the Election Commission of India. Again, in 2017, we have a question on simultaneous election to the Lok Sabha and state assemblies will limit the amount of time and money spent in an electioneering, but it will reduce the government's accountability to the people. Discuss. This is one such question. So, we could ask the question, model on simultaneous elections. Again, possibly in means. Coming to the context, the Congress party, which is a principal opposition party in the country, is opposed to this one nation, one election concept. It argues that it is undemocratic, that is, it is against the democratic principles of this country. Because democratic principles ultimately provide power to the people to decide who is supposed to be in power and who is not. But this is constraining the ability of the people to decide or ability of the people to continue the party which is in power for the extended period of time for which it is entitled to as per the constitution of India, which is five years or beyond in certain cases that we are going to see as we go along in this article. But this one nation, one election is said to hinder our democratic rights according to the principal opposition party as well as many opposition parties in our country. Thus, it is against the federalism concept as well. Why? Because they argue that it will limit the tenure of the state government if we give priority to one nation, one election. Now, democratic election management. How are we carrying out this democratic election management in our country? In our country, we have Election Commission of India as well as State Election Commission, which looks into conducting of elections at the parliament level, the state legislature level, as well as local bodies level. Local bodies level election is taken care of by the State Election Commission, whereas Election Commission of India conducts the election processes for filling the seats in parliament as well as state legislature. This you have to remember. Added to it, Despite being such a diverse country, such a large country, different states of different nature, different socio-economic 
statuses of different states, different profiles. Yet we are able to conduct the election successfully on account of various measures taken by the Election Commission of India in the form of EPIC, Electronic Voting Machine, VVPAD, that is Water Verified Paper Audit Trial, etc. All these mechanisms are ultimately leading to transparency in conducting elections. That is why people have trust in the election results of this country. And there is peaceful transfer of power from one government to other, despite change in political party, which is staking claim on forming the government. The democratic polity requires frequent conducting of elections that were designed on the principles adopted by the constitution, which is ultimately the will of the people. Thus, we have fixed tenure, etc., that takes care of the democratic credentials of this country. Added to it, various constitutional provisions show that India is democratic in nature. Article 83 says that India's, that is, the state legislative assemblies, as well as the Lok Sabha of the parliament, has a fixed tenure of five years. And this Article 83 corresponds to the Lok Sabha tenure. Articles 172 1 stipulates the tenure of state legislative assemblies to be five years. So we have to have a five year period of time of tenure these houses. Then Article 85 2B and Article 174 2B corresponds to the power of the President and Governor with regards to dissolving these houses on certain occasions. For example, the government which is in power could be in power only if it has support of the requisite members of the particular houses, either it might be Lok Sabha or it might be State Legislative Assembly. If they do not have enough numbers in terms of forming government, then it could be dissolved by the governor as well as president on the no confidence motion passed by the respective houses. Of course, there, is, there are other provisions in the constitution as well where we could limit the tenure of the state legislative assemblies even though it has the majority on certain grounds like it is not following the constitutional principles. Like for example, it is not secular. So in this way, there are various ways through which we could curb the extension of the government's tenure up to five years. But these are special cases. In certain cases, we could also extend the tenure of the houses. For example, we have Article 83.2 and Article 172.1, which gives the power for the house to extend the tenure beyond five years by one year at a time. But this is during the emergency. I'm not completely reading out the details of these extensions. These are only to show that only in certain cases, that too during special circumstances, we have the possibility to modify the tenures. Then comes the responsibility of conducting elections. It solely falls on Election Commission of India with regards to the elections of the Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, that is the parliament, as well as the state legislative assembly. It is under Article 324, which designates the Election Commission of India to conduct elections which is superintendence, direction, control and conduct of elections of parliament, state legislature. One other thing that you should remember is the president as well as vice president as well. And we have representation of People's Act 1950 and representation of People's Act 1951, which gives the power to the Election Commission of India to manage elections. At the same time, we have separate grant under the demand for grants of Ministry of Law and Justice constituting voted expenditure that is required for conducting elections. So in this way, we are able to conduct the elections. Then about one nation, one election. This system is to synchronize the election process as we already seen in the introductory part. Because presently, there is no synchronization of elections. We are always in the election cycle. And it is to reduce the frequency of polls in the country, both at the center as well as state level. In the center, many times the vacancies in the parliament is also leading to the elections. Of course, these are not as significant when compared to the state legislative assemblies that we are witnessing every year in this country. So that is about the simultaneous elections. We have precedents from other countries which are conducting simultaneous elections. In South Africa, we have elections at the central as well as state level for every five years. Whereas, at the local body, that is municipal elections, we have elections after two years after conducting the center and state level elections. 
then in Sweden, we have simultaneous elections at all the levels. So these are the models that we could aspire to if we want to implement one nation, one election. So why is there a need for us to adopt one nation, one election? Firstly, we have to have focused governance. The model code of conduct that we are supposed to implement during the election cycle is said to curb or said to hamper the governance of those particular regions. It might be state government or it might be central government. There are restrictions upon the state and central governments with regards to undertaking various activities. That is said to influence the elections of those particular regions. Thus, it ultimately hampers the continuity in functioning of the bureaucracy or taking decisions. Thus, policy paralysis might arise, especially during the time of need. Thus, for continuity in governance and for uniformity in governance, it is argued that it is better for us to have one nation, one election. Then, the continuity in policy decisions, which could be understood from the model code of conduct. And then reduce the election costs. Why? Because conducting periodic elections again and again, that leads to huge expenses, especially given the center and state going to polls at different periods of time, ultimately costing higher, especially to the political parties. We already know the kind of costs that we are bearing on account of the election costs. The political party's funding at the moment is not transparent enough for us to trust the election process. And higher costs ultimately leads to political parties depending more upon the funding. And thus, those who are the funders have the more power with regards to influencing the decisions of the government. Then comes the financial savings that we could achieve on account of conducting simultaneous elections. Especially, for example, the administrative expenses that are required. Deployment of administrative machinery, personnel, etc. At the same time, the security forces that are deployed so as to take care of the possible security issues that might arise in various regions where the law and order is not perfect enough for us to implement the election or have a uh, workspace for us to conduct elections peacefully. Then, the rec reduced security deployment, as we already seen, at the same time, improved state finances. Why? Because the implementation costs will go down. So these are the benefits that we are going to attain on account of implementing One Nation, One Election. But there are significant issues that are plaguing our ability to implement it in the first place. Firstly, the feasibility issues. How could you curb the tenures of the state legislative assemblies or extend the tenure of central legislature, that is Lok Sabha, to see that there is synchronization of election process. As you know, there is periodic election in the sense many states have elections at different periods of time, at different years. We have to fix or affix at five years. That requires curbing tenures of the states. What if one of the state legislative assemblies pose no, no confidence challenge to the ruling establishment? of that particular state. Now, how to continue the administration in those states? Should we allow the party which doesn't command the majority in that particular legislative assembly? What if this central legislature, that is Lok Sabha itself, throws up a challenge to the government with regards to passing no confidence motion? Should we allow it to continue to be in power when it lost its confidence? What about the possibility of breakdown in coalitions as we are seeing again and again where the parties have different ambitions or parties' ambitions have changed over a period of time leading to separation of the parties which have formed alliance to form government. So many challenges are posed. Whether it is feasible or possible or not in the first place itself is a challenge. Then coming to the logistical challenges in implementing, it, with, uh, either it might be having enough electronic voting machines or enough security personnel to be deployed, especially in the sensitive areas that India has with regards to the central India where the Naxalite challenges is still posing, Northeast refugee insurgency challenges, Kashmir separatist challenges. How could we able to manage simultaneous elections at such a scale given the sensitivities that 
are in place in various areas in this country. Or it might be administrative machinery. Does it have enough administrative manpower to actually see that we are able to properly govern the elections? Next, against federalism, why? Because state legislatures might witness hampering of tenure or extension of tenure. So that is undemocratic and that is not within the precincts of the provisions of the constitution. Then the legal hurdles that might arise. The constitutional challenges and legal challenges as we already seen. Because it violates constitutional provisions as well as representation of people act. We need to amend the constitution as well as laws significantly for it to happen. Despite that we could question these laws in the courts. That they are not upholding the federalism and democratic spirit that are enshrined in the constitution. Then comes the overshadowing regional interests. If we are going for simultaneous elections, we are campaigning at the same time for state legislative assembly votes as well as Lok Sabha votes. There is a chance that Lok Sabha issues, that is central level issues, might dominate the state level issues, taking to people giving confidence or having more confidence towards central issues which are magnanimous when compared to states. Having an all India character and thus evoking the feeling of nationalism. Whereas states have specific challenges that might not be connected to central issues. Of course, central issues are also prominent, but state level issues are different. Those are more direct in terms of governing. These are more visible, but these might not have that appeal when compared to the central levels. Because of the finances that the central government commands, its ability to influence voters is also high. This is one of the challenges and one of the issues being raised by various regional parties in the country. And the cost effectiveness debate. We are talking about the costs, but it is said that the costs are not significant enough for us to adopt this model. Added to it, democracy, though it costs, the cost is not that significant when compared to the principle that it upholds. It cannot be simply computed in terms of the costs that we face on account of implementing the elections periodically. Added to it, the initial cost to implement the one nation one election is far higher when compared to what we generally generalize that probably the election costs are going to get reduced by simultaneous elections. Then election expenses benefits do not far outweigh the principle. The current spat is the panel of Ramnath Kovin, which is a high level committee of one nation one election. It is said that it doesn't have enough representation to the opposition parties. So that is why it is biased according to the opposition parties. There is a necessity for having a consensual approach rather than giving advantage to one set of views to promote one nation one election in this country. Then only it will have trust with wider population. Look at the largest party which commands majority in the country. The votes it garnered is around 33%. So it is not a representative of the entire country. So there is a necessity for giving voice even to the opposition parties to have some sensitivity towards the issues with regards to implementing one nation one election. Then the opposition parties, that is why calling to dissolve this high level committee. And the issues with regards to model code of conduct were also raised by the opposition parties. They said that the model code of conduct is not that draconian enough to actually hamper the administration of this country. Certain schemes which are already in operation are allowed to be implemented. Only certain schemes which require dispersal of money that have the capability to influence the voters are banned. And even we could get the approval of the Election Commission of India to implement those schemes when there is a necessity. Then why are we saying that the model code of conduct is a culprit? is the demand raised by the opposition party and they critique the Niti Aayog report where Niti Aayog report has stated that curbing the tenure of the state for implementing one nation one election is acceptable but this is undemocratic according to the opposition parties. That is why they critique the Niti Aayog report on one nation one election and because it involves dissolving it is not acceptable. So what is the way forward? Way forward, what we could say is there is a need for dialogue, consultation and deliberation so that we could get consensus from all parties 
as well as the citizenry of this country to implement one nation one election at the same time what we have to take into consideration is there are many electoral reforms that are pending which require the approval for example rti having political parties within the ambit of rti to actually know that there is transparency in operation of political parties then we have funding issue whether the funding is transparent or not given the accusation that huge black money is injected into electioneering in this country the criminal nexus that we are witnessing on account of lack of transparency and the criminalization of politics that we are witnessing the family political parties and the political parties that are simply registered for garnering money in our country thus these are the issues that we are facing at the same time we have to also see the possibility of conducting elections for example conducting simultaneous elections once every 2 or 3 years rather than having an elections that are conducted synchronously where center and the states go to elections at one point of time so we could also see that various alternatives that we could adapt to promote the synchronization of elections but not attaining absolute uniformity in conducting elections which is not possible this completes the article now let us look into the next one this article speaks about the need for improving administration of science administering science and progressing its development is important in this country the innovations that are done through the projects of science and of the development of technology that ultimately leads to runs the economies of the world as you know various technologies are emerging the new coming technologies like the artificial intelligence robotics big data data analytics data science etc that requires immense investment in terms of manpower in terms of technological labs projects to improve the science and technology in this country and make it a powerhouse in terms of technology as well as economy but various issues are plaguing india to realize or harness its potential that is what we are going to see in this art how to improve the science and technology development in this country the relevance of the topic we are going to learn about india's science ecosystem and science and innovation how to translate the scientific prowess that india has or scientific uh, capacity that it has in terms of scientists and developing the technology through the utilization of these resources either it might be money or it might be the skilled personnel next coming to upsc syllabus mains gs paper 3 achievement of indians in science and technology indigenization of technology and developing new technology so this topic could be linked to this topic <coughs> that is the upsc syllabus we have previous year questions for example india's achievements in the field of space science and technology generally the questions are asked regarding the way social developments could be enhanced through the utilization of science and technology in this country especially given the contribution of isro in developing our space science and technology and the applications it has on our daily lives as well as improving our social outcomes like for example river link connectivity exploration of minerals improving disaster forecasting etc it has various technologies at the same time in the year 2020 we have a question on covid-19 pandemic and how the improvement in technology led to the way we could deal with the issues that we are facing through covid for example rapid space at which we are able to develop vaccine and vaccinate the entire population in quick span of time thus building the immunity of the population and reducing the possible impacts that this covid-19 could have on this country now let us look into the context the context is the editorial presents us a way through which we could improve the administration of science and it gives a comparative analysis of the us system which is a giant in developing science and technology so we have to learn the model adopted by the us system rather than relying on the already existing model of india which is actually not performing that well so the challenges faced the first is low r&d investment the investment made by this country in improving the science and technology is low it is only 0.7% of gdp it is quite low when compared to the countries like china us israel etc these countries are now the emerging hubs 
in terms of science and tech. And as India is aspiring for a global powerhouse status, it is incumbent upon it to invest more on science and technology and become a powerhouse in terms of improving the technologies, especially the modern ones like artificial intelligence, big data, data analytics, etc. Thus, this underinvestment is one of the cause of worry. Added to it, our insufficient resource allocation. On the one hand, our investment is only 0.7% of GDP. On the other hand, we are not able to channelize the limited resources that we have into developing technologies that has huge potential. So that is why it is important for us to improve the investments in artificial intelligence, robotics and other such new sectors or new technological know-hows that are required for us to be developed. We already have lower investments. Added to it, we need to have a continual supply of resources. Certain times our researches fail. So we have to plan for long-term projects. All this requires proper management. How to manage our resources, how to manage our investments, human resources, laboratory, establishing new projects, of innovating in new ways to develop those projects and seeing that these resources are channelized to different regions of these countries where different expertise is available. So all this is lacking in our country. Added to it, we have administrative inefficiencies. The administration that is required to improvise the way in which we are administering science is lacking in the country. The inefficiencies in terms of administering. Inefficiencies in this case refers to the decision making that we are doing, the funds we are allocating, the policies that we are planning, but we are failing to implement these policies in the first place. That is, turning out the policies into the final outcome is the major, major issue here. This ultimately leads to crucial issues like crucial infrastructure project delays. Research timelines are not being met in, in time. So we are planning a project to be implemented in few years, but yet we are not able to. That is improving the developing of technologies within specified period of time or else other countries will go far ahead and compare to us and thus our ability to compete at the global level will be reduced. Then comes the scientists as administrators, which is one of the major issues that is plaguing science infrastructure in the country. Scientists are supposed or considered or assumed that they are going to be the best administrators. But doing scientific work is different from the management work. Managerial expertise requires different kind of expertise when compared to science, when compared to being scientist. The generalization that scientists could be a best administrator is misplaced. The recent achievements in science and technology, which is far lower when compared to the countries like China itself, is an indication that the present way of administering the science is not perfect. For that purpose, there is a need for us to change the way we are doing or where the, the way we are administering science. So that is why scientists who are presently handling the administrative works are not able to perform to the level that is expected from them. And the added issue is the conflict of interest that may arise if scientists are made administrators. In India, the problem is scientists are not only doing the academic works, they are also involving in administration. If they are indulging in particular academic work, favoring this academic work might be important for them compared to the other things. So the ego that might plague these scientists could ultimately lead to giving priority to their own projects when compared to others. This is the conflict of interest we are talking about. Added to it, if there is any grudge between our scientists who are administrators compared to the other academicians that exist or that are working in various institutions, various labs, projects, etc., that ultimately leads to these clashes leading to the scientist who is the administrator trying to utilize his or her power to favor his or her interest when compared to the other academicians. Thus, we'll be losing talent on the first place, inefficiency in utilization of talent in the other place. Other thing is that we are not providing enough work environment for other scientists to thrive and develop technologies in this country. 
then come to distinct separation of roles. What we see in US is a different way of administering science. In US, the scientists are groomed to become administrators. As administration requires different set of skills, they find the talent within the scientists and groom them to be administrators of those particular projects or institutions. Thus, we are seeing efficiency in terms of utilization of resources in US and thus leading to improvement in developing technologies. Especially if you look at the achievements of US in artificial intelligence, big data, etc. itself is a testament that their method is working well when compared to ours. And thus, the US model of focusing and specializing administration is what India should adopt. Coming to the comparison, so we already seen all the issues that India is plaguing with with regards to administering science. We'll now compare it with the United States and make some assertions. For example, R&D investment we already seen in India is quite low. Coming to administrative structure, our India is facing the dual tasks that certain scientists are also acting as administrators, thus leading to inefficiencies. Then coming to United States where there is clear separation, certain scientists are groomed as administrators, thus improving our or improving their administration of science. And innovation ecosystems in India, despite having improvement in terms of IT or IT boom, yet we are not able to develop the recent technologies that are required like artificial intelligence. Whereas United States is continually performing and uh, upgrading, progressing in these technologies. Public-private collaboration in India is quite low, given the various ways in which there is a possibility of building the collaboration. We are not able to attain them. For example, the way in which Oxford University, Stanford University, etc. are building billion-dollar companies itself is an indication that the scientific minds as well as the academic potential of these universities could be utilized to actually build businesses. But in India, we are still unable to promote a fruitful collaboration between institutions as well as private entities. Yet, India is trying to make progress in it, like for example, Make in India initiative. Then coming to talent retention, India is failing in talent ret retention. One of the reasons, as we already seen, is the administration that is being carried out, which is ultimately leading to inefficiency and discouragement of the talent. That is the reason why we are witnessing brain drain issues and even the scientists that are moving abroad so as to find a better career alternative. Coming to United States, what we are seeing is they are able to attract and retain the talent as well. As Indians going there and not only continuing or pursuing their profession, they are settling in United States itself because of the career opportunities that it presents. Added to it, the United States has huge capital. This capital is being utilized for R&D developments. So recently, we are trying to improve our scientific organizations or the institutions that are at the helm to build or improve our science and technology. Like for example, National Research Foundation establishment. It is trying to promote high impact research across various disciplines. At the same time, we are trying to Restructure DRDO, that is Defense Research and Development Organization. So what are the proposed reforms? As we already seen various issues, firstly, we need to increase our R&D investments, which is 0.7% of GDP at the moment. We need to increase it to 2% of GDP. At the same time, we have to see that these resources are channelized to various new technological arenas, like for example, renewable energy. So we are on the way of improving technologies in various fields like nuclear power, etc. But we are struck. We are not pursuing it at a pace which is expected. For example, we are also planning to improve the thorium-based nuclear power plant. But the pace at which it is going on is quite low. Added to it, we have to train specialized administrators rather than relying on science to be administrators on the model to the US. Similarly, these are to be dedicated cadre of science administrators, like giving them all India status, like all India services, Indian administrative service. Similarly, we could develop Indian science services so that they could administer various science projects throughout the country. What we are witnessing as of now is these scientists who are acting as administrators are being focused in specific institutions. 
and thus this is ultimately leading to them monopolizing the power and decision making capabilities there ultimately leading to the inefficiencies thus these institutional capture is ultimately leading to not retaining enough talent or not developing enough talent within those institutions and creating a central service of science administration as we already talked about so that we could man the various organizations in this country for that purpose we have to look into the model adopted by cerm next emphasizing the long term and resilient funding we should not stop funding just because we are not finding enough results as expected we should keep on investing until we get the results certain times failures are imminent even with regards to the science and technology investments especially science and technology requires a lot of time for us to fructify the results and thus long term support should be inevitable the example here that could be stated is large hadron collider so this completes the article now let us look into another one recently prime minister of the country inaugurated sixth edition of khelo india youth games while conducting the inauguration he has spoken about the reform measures taken by this government to improve the performance of the athletes that has led to substantial results we got many medals around the world that too at the youth level at the international level at the para level as well in this article we are going to learn about the reform measures taken by the government to improve the performance of the athletes at the same time we are going to learn about target olympic podium scheme as well coming to the relevance of the topic with regards to the upsc reforms in sports as well as target olympic podium scheme and upsc syllabus prelims current events of national importance and main gs paper 2 governance as we are dealing with the various reform measures taken by the government we have various questions that are asked in the previous year examinations for example consider the following statements in respect of the 32nd summer olympics so here we are going to learn about the olympics so this topic is of relevance in the 32nd summer olympics they have asked about the official motto at the same time various sports whether they have been included in the olympics or not so sports is obviously an important topic for examination perspective the context as we already seen prime minister has given the report card of the government and the measures taken now let us look into various reform measures that has led to improvement in performance of india coming to the national sports development code so this code is to improve the transparency and promote good governance transparency is nothing but how the decisions are being taken in the bureaucracy that is in business of implementing various administrative measures for running the sports governance nothing but the officials the bureaucratic officials how they are to be selected their tenure and how the decisions are to be conducted etc this ultimately leads to improvement in governance so that the funds allocated for improvement in performance of the athletes could be utilized for the purpose that has been stated so in this way what we could expect is to see that the measures taken by the government are actually implemented at the ground level it is only possible if the governance or the bureaucracy which performs the business of governance is performing as per the expected standards that are logical coming to decentralization of sports authority of india sports of authority of india are nothing but various sports authorities that are established in india by the government in various regions thus they improve the performance of these regions by selecting athletes and training them and if you are providing power to the sports authority of india obviously it will have the knowledge as well as power decision making capabilities to actually take decisions that are helpful for improving the performance of the sports in those various regions so in this way empowering them is important rather than having a centralized model at the top coming to the focus on the grassroots development the grassroots development as the name itself suggests we want to take the talent from the rural areas as well as certain marginalized or underprivileged communities 
who doesn't have the resources that are required to excel in sports. As you know, sports requires a lot of investments. Even athletics requires a lot of investments. And these investments could be pursued only by the body like Government of India or certain private entities which are trying to improve their marketing capabilities by funding various athletes. So in this way, we will be able to see that the resources are effectively utilized for sports development. And financial support and infrastructure has also been given ample scope by the Government of India. Target Olympic Podium Scheme is one such in which we select certain elite athletes who excel in their respective sports and provide them the requisite support that is required right from the start of the dieting, from their journey to the eventual success that we are now tasting at the competition levels. And the reforms further are the public-private partnership. We are engaging private parties, trying to attract them to participate in this developmental effort. And we are funding for emerging sports and not only focusing on traditional sports where India is already excelling. Of course, we are funding those sports as well. In addition to it, we are trying to improve the performance of Indian athletes in various other sports as well. For example, archery, badminton, shooting, weightlifting, etc. Indians obviously excel in certain sports like boxing as well as wrestling. We are trying to diversify the arenas where Indians could perform well. Coming to the technology and science integration that we are trying to adapt to improve the performance. We are giving online coaching platforms, data analytical tools, etc. to improve the performance. Trying to focus on the areas where we actually lack and trying to see that we are at the world class level. We have National Center for Sports Science as well, which provides the scientific support that is required to the athletes. Thus, we could improve the performance of the athletes. Coming to the gender equality that we are trying to attain. For that, we are providing scholarship facilities and trying to see that the Olympics as well as athletic championships that are being held are conducted at a level playing field for increased participation of female participants. Next, coming to the para sports. We are seeing again and again our excellence in the performance with regards to para Olympics as well as para sports. That is only possible due to the support that this present establishment is extending to these Paralympics. So, these are the reform measures. Now, let us look into Target Olympic Podium Scheme. The objective of the scheme, obviously, is to increase the performance of our athletes and increase our medal tally at various international competitions, including Olympics. And the ministry that is uh, provided with the responsibility to implement this scheme is Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. And the year where it has its origin is 2014. You have to remember these years as well, especially for preliminary examination point of view. Coming to the revamp that was done in the year 2018 to improve the athletic support given to these athletes. We are trying to provide holistic support right from dieting, international athletic sports facilities, international coaches who excel in coaching in those particular games, etc. And high priority sports has been chosen. High priority sports is generally the tactic played by different countries to improve their medal tally. Each country is said to have an excellence in various sports. These sports, as you know, or athletics, as you know, are many. Certain countries perform well in certain sports. Similarly, we have certain well-performing sports like archery, badminton, boxing, hockey, shooting and wrestling in which generally the medals earned by Indians is quite high. Coming to Mission Olympic Cell. Mission Olympic Cell is a body that is established to see that we have assistance to the athletes to improve the medal tally and it is under the TOP scheme itself and we have a chairman for this Mission Olympic Cell. It is Directive General of the Sports Authority of India. Then we have a charitable fund 
under which we have the funding that is required for the athletics, that is National Sports Development Fund. So this is about the target Olympic podium scheme. Coming to the future vision, we are trying to host youth games in the year 2029 and Olympic games by the year 2036. Meticulous preparation are ongoing at the moment. This is quite competitive and challenging. Why? Because we have to compete with various countries to have the rights to host Olympic games in our country. At the same time, we are trying to build up the sports industry that ultimately improves not only our sporting facilities. At the same time, it will expand the market for the sports goods. It might be running shoes, etc., etc. It is estimated that our sports industry is valued at around rupees 1 lakh crore. This also has the added advantage of providing employment to the youth. Thus, in this way, we are improving our performance in the sports. Now, let us look into another article. Ram Temple in Ayodhya will be inaugurated on 22nd January. India is a land where architectural styles are varied. Varied for different religions for different regions, etc. And these architectural styles are important, especially from the examination point of view. In this article, we are going to look into the style that has been adopted for building this Ram Temple. And we are going to try to differentiate between different styles of architecture. At the same time, the similarities that exist between these different styles. The article's relevance with respect to UPSC is learning the temple architecture in India. Then, the syllabus point of view, it falls under GS Paper 1, Architecture from Ancient to Modern Times. Now, let us examine the previous year examination question. In the year 2020, the question has been asked with regards to the philosophy and traditions that have an influence upon the monuments. The philosophy and tradition represent the societal values, beliefs, the way of life. This way of life ultimately finds its expression on the art forms. As you know, the artists who conceive or who use their creativity to build the architecture or to, to create an art form are from within us. They experience what we experience collectively in the societal way of life. Thus, these elements are found in the creativity of these artists and thus the architecture and monuments is nothing but the expression of the society itself. So in this way we could relate both of them. And how various structures are prominent in these architectural forms, how these are ultimately related to our way of life and how we could relate it to the philosophy and traditions of the society is what being asked in the question. Next, we have another question. Discuss the main contribution of Gupta period and Chola period to Indian heritage and culture. So, it talks about the contribution of the Guptas for developing India's architecture. And thus, the heritage. Then also, the development of the culture. So, in this way, this topic is of relevance for examination. Similarly, we could expect questions on the architectural forms of temple. The context is simple. In the year 2019, as we have seen, Supreme Court has given its verdict on the disputed land, that this disputed land belongs to the Hindus. The evidence upon which this verdict was given is that of the archaeological relevance. The archaeological remnants that lay hidden beneath this Islamic architecture, that is the Babri Masjid. And thus, on that basis, verdict was finalized. Then on, the construction of the Ram Temple was started. And this was started in the year 2020. Now, on 22nd January 2024, the inauguration of the temple is expected. The main chief architect of this temple is Chandrakant Sompur. And... The style that has been adopted in constructing this temple is Gurjara Chalukya style. So this is about the context. Now let us look into various types of temple architecture. As you know, India is a land of diversity. Either it is with respect to different regions, languages, religions, etc. 
we have various types of styles that have emerged within our country. Of course, we have also adopted certain structures or certain styles of architectures from other countries. We have synchronization of culture in the country. And also the styles have traveled from north to south in terms of the varied differences. Added to it, these were adopted, some were rejected and ultimately led to blossoming of diversity in terms of architecture in our country. Now let us look into different styles of architecture. We have cave temple architecture which has its origin in 5th century CE. The examples are the Ellora cave temples. Then comes the Nagara style. The Nagara style has its origin in the year 6th to 12th century. The examples are Kandariya Mahadeva temple in Madhya Pradesh. Then we have Dravidian style which has said to be originated in the year 7th century CE and the examples are Brihadeshwara temple in Tanjavur. Then the Visara style, it is from 9th to 13th century. Then the example is Elephanta caves in Maharashtra. Then comes the Hoyasala style of temple architecture, it is from 11th to 14th century. Chennakeshava temple in Bellur and Hoyasalashwara temple in Halipedu are the examples. These different styles are important for the examination point of view. At the same time, you need to be aware of the examples as well. Then comes the difference between the Nagara and the Dravida style of temple architecture. Learning these two styles of temple architecture for examination is important. That too in a mains examination. We will be able to learn the differences among these temple architectures. Firstly, the geographical region. So, where the de development of these styles of temple architecture has taken place in our country. Dravida style, as the name itself suggests, has its origin in the southern India. It has been developed in Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. Whereas the Nagara style has its origin in the northern part of the country. It has been found in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. It is not that these styles of temple architecture are confined only to these regions. Of course, they have spread to different parts of the country. But the origin is said to be in the northern and the southern states. Thus, there are certain differences between the styles of temple architecture. Firstly, the tower. This tower is above the Garbhagriha. So, Garbhagriha is a sanctum sanctorum where the deity is placed. This is considered the most sacred part of the temple. Above it, we have Shikhara. And this is called as Shikhara in Nagara style of architecture. We call this as Kopuram in Dravida style of architecture. This structure lays above the Garbhagruha. As the name itself suggests, it is called as a towering structure like a hill. Hence the name Shikhara. And the tower is different in shape with regards to the Dravida style as well as Nagara style. In Dravida style, it is pyramidal in shape, whereas in Nagara style, it is curvilinear in shape. For example, this is the Nagara style. Then comes the number of towers. So, this is one tower. The number of towers vary with regards to different styles of architecture. For Dravida style, we generally find only one tower. Whereas, in, Shik in Nagara style, we find multiple towers resembling the hills or the mountains that we see around the hill regions. Coming to the Gopurams. Gopuram is nothing but the Shikhara that we are talking about, which is called as Shikhara in Nagara style as well as Gopuram in Dravida style. And this Gopuram is elaborately decorated in Dravida style of architecture. If you look at the examples and find the images in the net, you will find that the intricate carvings, the sculptures are far more varied and rich in Dravida style. Whereas in Nagara style, the concentration given to decorating this Shikhara is lower. The prominent element is Gopuram and Shikhara with regards to the Dravida and Nagara style as we have already seen. Coming to the boundaries. The boundaries are nothing but the walls that enclose the temple. High importance is given to Dravida style, whereas it is not that important in Nagara style. So, in certain temples you find these enclosed walls, in certain temples you don't find or you don't usually find these temple walls. 
Then comes the entrance deities. Nothing but the deities which are placed at the gateways of these temple architectural styles. These are called as Dwarpalas. The Dwarpalas that are at the entrance of the temple architecture. Then what we usually found in Nagara style is Ganga and Yamuna rivers which are personified and are placed near the entrance. Coming to the pedestals. Pedestals are at the ground level for Dravida style as well as they are at higher level for Nagara style. These are the differences between the different styles of architecture. As we already seen that these are not the only different styles of temple architectures. There are various temple architectural styles. And within these temple architectural styles, we have sub-styles that emerged on account of the regional differences. That is, we could see the different traditions, different value systems that are not that distinct enough so as to completely differentiate both of them, but slight differences that led to emergence of different styles within this country. Coming to the similarities between these two styles, the vertical structure, nothing but we have already seen the shikharas or the towers. These towers are so high in terms of their standing that if you look at them, it will feel as if that is making a connection between earthly and celestial realms. Coming to the sacred sanctum or the sanctum sanctorum where the deity is placed for worship, it is considered the most sacred in both the style temple architectures. Coming to the axial alignment, if you start from the gopuram, which is nothing but gateway, gopuram to garbhagriha, you could see an alignment in terms of the structure. Coming to the symbolism in design, the importance that has been given to the design, the sculptures and carvings are given importance in both temple architectural styles. The mandapa or hall, which is generally placed or which is generally constructed near to sanctum sanctorum, what we generally find or what we generally practiced in the past in these mandapas or halls is the rituals, congregational activities where members gather around performing rituals, various functions and even educational performances where culture is communicated or culture is expressed ultimately leading to the possibility of similarities in terms of value systems among the members of the society. Thus, temple acted in a way so as to perform the process of socialization where the people of the society are able to learn values that are in acceptance by majority members of the society. Coming to the enclosed temple complex, so nothing but whether there is an enclosure of the temples, generally we find these are prominent in both the temple style architectures. That is the sacred spaces for devotees to perform the function of worshipping the deities, thus sustaining the religious activity. So this is about the different temple architectural styles. And this is especially important for preliminary examination point of view. Now let us look into another article. Recently, Supreme Court has asked the government to give a plan through which it would conserve the great Indian bustard species. Given the deaths of the great Indian bustard species on account of the high power transmission lines, it asked for a plan to see that they could conserve as well as see that the projects that are in place, which are leading to the deaths of the great Indian bustard species. And to see that the projects that are built up to see that there is a transmission of the power of the renewable energy that is being produced in Rajasthan and Gujarat, these projects could continue. At the same time, we could also simultaneously conserve the great Indian bustard species. So this is a challenging task that these governments are facing in the Gujarat as well as Rajasthan. In this article, we are going to see about the great Indian bustard species, its conservation status and the challenges that it is facing. That is leading to its status being critically endangered as per the IUCN Red List. The topic's relevance is, that is we are going to learn about the Great Indian Bustard species, its status of being critically endangered and ecological niche. Next, the UPSC syllabus, we are going to learn about environmental ecology, means conservation of the species. We have questions that are asked in the previous year examination. 
for example with reference to india's desert national park which of the following statements are correct so great indian bustard has a natural habitat in this desert national park so that is the question about similarly we could expect question on the great indian bustard coming to the context the context is the supreme court question to the center regarding its plan to conserve the species given the threat that it is facing on account of the high power transmission network coming to its nature it is a large ground dwelling bird it is the heaviest flying bird that is why it is important coming to its habitat it is in tropical grasslands coming to its nature it is omnivorous that is both meat eating as well as vegetarian and its distribution rajasthan gujarat maharashtra ap karnataka you have to remember these states we have seen the questions that are being asked in the examination on the regions where these birds or certain animals are inhabited coming to the status i use in status of the birds or animals that are endangered is important critical endangered is far more important as per the red book of the iucn the status of the bird is critically endangered and it has been cited in sites appendix 1 that is conservation on internal trade in endangered species appendix 1 so it has been given the highest order of protection that could be afforded as per the sites convention which has been agreed by various countries thus they it is legally binding so that these countries have to implement and take measures for effective conservation of these birds and then we have convention on migratory species which is appendix 1 in this two this bird is placed in appendix 1 so it has been given highest priority next why it is identified as a representative bird or keystone species of the grasslands the presence of the bird is an indicator that the grassland ecosystem is in proper health so if we want to calculate the health of the particular ecosystem we have various species that gives an indication of the health this is one such coming to its services the ecological services provided by it are the locust control which is a particular issue that we are facing in certain regions like gujarat rajasthan etc so their presence is important to control the locusts thus it will reduce the impact on the agricultural fields which is one of the reason why we are witnessing a declination in produce in the recent years particularly given the changed cycles of these locusts and the attack that we are facing on account of this migration of these locusts it is important to maintain proper health of the ecosystem and also conserve the birds the conservation challenges that we are facing are firstly the habitat loss and fragmentation due to the fragmentation of habitat on account of the incursion of human activities either through agriculture or housing next the power line collisions is one of the is prominent issues that we are facing we already seen it in the introductory slide in the human wildlife conflict where human beings are completely or continually in contact with these animal species thus conserving it is becoming difficult the agricultural practices that is one of the reason of the incursion into the habitat of the animals thus reducing the habitat of the animals leading to the man animal conflict at the same time reduction of the habitat space of these animals the government has taken various measures to improve the conservation of these birds firstly protection under indian wildlife protection act 1972 we have project great indian bustard through which we intend to conserve as well as promote the conservation efforts next we are, are trying to promote conservation breeding <clears throat> at the same time we are declaring certain regions as national park sanctuaries ecosystem zones where we have the habitat of these great indian bustards so this completes the article now let us look into various questions that are modeled on the articles that have been discussed coming to the first question consider the following statements regarding election system in india in india elections for house of people that is lok sabha and all state legislative assemblies were held simultaneously only once in 91 1951 52 this is false next because uh, in this we have seen that in the subsequent three elections 
you have seen simultaneous elections being conducted. Later on, due to various reasons, you have seen the periodic elections where there is no alignment between the central and state elections all the time. Next, the constitution provides a five-year tenure for the House of People while it is silent on the term for state legislative assemblies. This is false as we already seen that the constitution did prescribe or did say that even the tenure of the state legislative assembly is five years. Article 324 designates the Election Commission of India with the superintendence, direction, control and conduct of elections to parliament, state legislatures and president only. This is false as it is tasked with the responsibility to conduct elections for vice president as well. How many of the above statements are incorrect? The answer is C. All are incorrect. Consider the following statements about Target Olympic Podium Scheme. It was launched by the Ministry of Youth, Affairs and Sports. This is true. Its primary objective is to enhance India's performance at the Commonwealth Games. This is false as we have already seen. Its primary responsibility is to increase the medal tally. Thus, it is targeting Olympics. Next, the mission Olympic cell responsible for assisting TOPS athletes is chaired by the sports minister. This is true. How many of the above given statements are correct? The answer is B, only two. Next, consider the following statements regarding election system in India. The constitution of India allows the extension of the Lok Sabha's term beyond five years for up to one year at a time. This we have seen, it is true. Next, as of now, Lok Sabha's term has never been extended beyond five years. This is false as we have seen. In the 1976, when national emergency was imposed, its term was extended beyond five years. Choose the correct option from the following. The answer is A, one only. Next, with respect to the Great Indian Bustard, which of the following is correct? Great Indian Bustard is endemic to desert regions of the subcontinent. This is false as we have seen that its habitat is extended even to the southern India in Karnataka. Project Great Indian Bustard was launched by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. This is false as it is the project by state government Rajasthan. Great Indian Bird Bustard plays an important role in containing the locust attack. This is true as we have seen in the article. Next, Kailashnath Temple in Ellora is constructed in which style of architecture? The answer is B. The Vidian style. Next, the means practice question. Discuss the key challenges faced by India's science ecosystem and suggest appropriate reforms and recommendations to enhance the effectiveness of the science sector in India. You have seen the article in detail which speaks about all these dimensions. From that, you could write the answer. In the introduction, write the reasons for India's failure, the India's ecosystem and its global standing. You could quote various reports to show the ranking of India in terms of research and development. Also, the spending that it is doing. In the body, write the challenges. We have seen the challenges in detail. First, the low investment in R&D, which is close to 0.7% of GDP. Administrative efficiencies, which is one of the reasons why we are not taking up the hi-fi projects that are important for the technological progress in the country. And dual role of scientists, where they are playing, playing the role of both the scientists as well as administrators. Lack of strategic focus, especially on the technologies, the emerging technologies like AI, robotics, etc. Thus, we are falling behind when compared to the global standards. Then, you write the reforms and recommendations. You could quote the US example, which is a giant in technological advancement. Increasing the R&D budget, specialized administrators, that is, we could train the scientists to be administrators or uh, select administrators who have the ability to take up the projects of science and technology and streamline funding and decision making, especially because we need to take long-term projects that require long-term focus and funding. Next, focus on key areas which are emerging technologies. In the conclusion, write down the need for a strategic overhaul of the India's science ecosystem. Why? Because presently we are falling behind when compared to the global standards. For that, you could quote the example of US, UK, etc where the collaboration between the industry as well as the university is one of the reasons for their rise as a technological giant. This completes the articles and questions. Please do like, share and subscribe our channel. Thank you.